What's up, everybody? I'm Taylor Silver from GeekWire. We're here with Dr. Mark Emmert, the president of the NCAA and former Husky. Yep. Got to mention no, that. Still, always a Husky, not, not former Husky. <laughs> always once, a Husky. Once a Husky, always a Husky. You were a student and you were a president at the UW as well. Um, Got to talk about football, of course. That was pretty fun to see them in the college football playoff. Yeah, it was great fun. I was actually at the game in Atlanta, and, uh, you know, Alabama's obviously a very, very good team, but. You know, where, where the Huskies are right now and where Coach Peterson has them is very impressive. I was really proud of them. And we're here at CES in Las Vegas, the big tech show. Is this your first time here? It is my first time here, yeah. What an amazing uh, venue. This is incredible. First impressions? I mean, there's so much technology and a lot of gizmos and gadgets. What's your first impression so far? Well, it's pretty overwhelming. You know, there's I, I, I heard someone say there was 150,000 people here at the convention. That makes it one of the biggest in the world, if not the biggest. Uh, the, just the sheer number of, of booths and, and uh, exhibitors is uh, amazing. I'm anxious to spend the afternoon getting to look at some of the wares. And as we talk about technology and gadgets and all, all, all of that stuff, how do you in your position, you know, leading the NCAA, how do you guys think about technology? Is it, you know, a priority for you guys? Um, how do you talk about it in meetings? Like, what does technology mean for, for the NCAA? Yeah, it's a very high priority for us, and we, we think about it in a lot of ways. We think about it in, in terms of how do we interact with fans and how do we change that nature of fan experience, whether it's in venue or, or at a distance. We think about it in terms of how do we help our student athletes um, both perform better on the court but also protect their health and wellness. And, and also also help them be better students. So one of the things that's often ignored is that the ability to do distance learning now is so strong that when you're traveling a lot as a student athlete, all of a sudden you can take your class with you. You you, you have the ability to, to not miss as much class because it's portable now. So that helps our students a lot. And then finally, we want to use it as an analytical tool to help coaches think about what they do and how they do it and, and how they can interact with their, their students because the one thing that stays constant for us is the age of our college athletes, right? It's always 18 to 22. They're always right in that sweet spot and they're always changing and always new. So for a, a coach um, who might be my age, you know, they got to say, yeah, what, what do we do here and how do we interact with a millennial? It's a very different, different student than, you know, a baby boomer. And it seems even more important because they're in that age group and they love technology and they use it every day to just keep it a priority, as you said. And I think it's interesting to compare the NCAA to other pro leagues just in terms of how you're using technology. But the NCAA is a little different because there's so many teams and so many players. Um, and fairness is a thing we talk about a lot with, you know, it, it, does one team get all the gizmos and gadgets and all the analytical tools and the other team doesn't have any because of, uh, you know, financial issues or whatever? How do you think about fairness, as, especially as it pertains to using new technology? Yeah, I think, first of all, uh, one of the issues about the comparison between us and uh, the NBA, for example, is that you know the NBA has 30 teams or 32, whatever it is. We have 19,000 teams, right? They have 450 players. We have almost a half a million uh, young men and women playing NCAA sport across the country. So it's vastly um, larger and vastly more diverse. So they're in three different divisions, might be a small liberal arts college or the University of Washington or Texas. So you do have huge differences and differentials around technology and the ability to support it. One of the great things about technology is over time the price tends to move down. So a small school may not be able to afford the latest and greatest this year, but next year they probably can. So that's one of the nice things about it that works really well for us. Yeah, you're going to see the 50 or so best funded schools with the biggest budgets always have some little ability to, to, to buy the next gadget or gizmo and bring it in and try it out. But for the most part, we get parity and balance because of the number of students that are allowed on any one team. So you, you might have the best budget in college basketball, but that year you only get to recruit five teams, just like the lowest budget school. And, and so you might be competing for the five best kids, but so is everybody else in the conference. And those kids want playing time and they want to go to a school they're going to enjoy. So we get, when you look at, for example, March Madness, we get remarkable parity. You know, we, we see all the time a relatively small school, Gonzaga, incredibly successful, not a high budget school, but plays really, really well. Uh, you, you saw Florida Gulf Coast make a wonderful run last year. You see Wichita State, a lot of schools that you would not say are high budget schools play great ball. So we managed to balance that that parity pretty well. I'm, I'm pretty pleased with where it works, how it works. And you mentioned health and wellness. Um, and, and earlier on the panel you were on with uh, some other you know big time folks like Adam Silver, you mentioned concussions and that's obviously a big topic. Um, what do you guys? How are you guys using technology and data and analytics to you know help improve the safety of, of the players? Not just in football, but you mentioned women's soccer. You were seeing a lot of concussions there too. 
Yeah, so we're engaged right now in the biggest concussion study in the world. It's a study we're doing with the DOD. We want it to be a longitudinal study so we can track um, young men and women through their entire life is, is the objective here. It's because a lot of the, the, the potential for development of a brain injury, for example, doesn't occur for years and years and years. So we, we've got to understand, science has to understand this a lot better. We also are taking every lesson that we learn, all the analytics and data that we get, we're bringing it in immediately and using it to change rules. So we just this year changed our our football practice regimen, for example, about how many times you can have contact, what kind of contact, what can you do around two a days in the in the fall, in the spring rather, and summer. How do you manage all of those things? So uh, the technology that we're mostly using are wearables and and um, a, a variety of accelerometers and helmets, so you can see what's really going on with contact. You can start to figure out what's a concussive impact and what's a sub-concussive impact or just frequent contact and, and, and how can you keep track of that. There's a lot of issues around what the rotational uh, issues are with football helmets and with soccer, for example. So by using a variety of technology, you can start collecting all those data. So you got a lot of sensor arrays out there now, and then you got to do big data work, right? So now you've got a tsunami of data. So now you got to go into big data research and analytics and say, okay, what are we learning from this? What's the impact of concussion or other related um, head injury? And, and then how can we come back and immediately change rules to, to make it all um, as safe as possible? Same thing's true in other injuries. You know, we've got, we've got issues around knees, for example, in women athletes. What can we do using the same kind of analytics and sensor data and wearables so that we can get a better understanding of the physiology of, of injury? A lot of opportunity there, clearly. Great opportunities. It's a really exciting time. And lastly, you know, we are from Seattle, GeekWire, and do you ever get back in town or are you busy with your fairly busy job? Well, I travel around a lot, but we still have a home uh, in the Seattle area. I still have a son who lives in the Seattle area, and, and most importantly, he has my grandchildren. So we get in and out of Seattle a lot. I still serve on a couple of boards there, so I'm, I'm in and out of Seattle and love it. It's still home. And any thoughts about how Anna, uh, Marie Kase is the new president? Any thoughts about how she seems like she's been doing a really good job, at least from uh, we cover startups and innovation a lot in the UW, just continues to become you know one of the top innovative co universities in the world. Well, I'm extremely enthusiastic about Anna Mari. Um, I helped bring her into the administration when I was president, and I think she's exactly the right leader for the time. And uh, I've been with her on a number of occasions. She seems to be enjoying the job a great deal, and all the feedback I get is really, really positive. So I think the I think the university is in great shape and heading in the right direction. Well, Dr. Emmer, thanks for the time. Appreciate it. My pleasure.